Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Priyanka Chaudhry, a partner at EY, where we're proud supporters of the City Club. It's my pleasure today to introduce our conversation about leadership from a unique perspective, women. At EY, we let, spend a lot of time advising clients on their business strategy, as well as how to make their operations more efficient. A question that we often get from clients is what is the secret sauce to high performance? Here's some of the information that we've known for a long time. Gender balance at the leadership level is associated with higher stock values and greater profitability. Mixed gender boards outperform all male boards, and hedge funds run by women outperform hedge funds run by men. <laughs> now, this is all research done by others. So we wanted to do our own research. And in 2016, we teamed with the Peterson Institute of Economics to survey 22,000 companies across the globe to study the impact of gender diversity. One of the things that the Peterson study found was that companies that have 30% more women in leadership positions have up to 6% higher margin than similar companies without women in leadership positions. So clearly, this is a significant game-changing advantage that women bring to leadership roles. Given this, we were thrilled to learn that local consulting firm Brown Flynn was celebrating its 20th anniversary with a book exploring how women lead. With their book, Uplifting Leaders Who Happen to be Women, Barbara Brown and Margie Flynn give us even greater insight into the ingredients of the secret sauce that women bring to the organizations they lead. Moderating our dialogue today on this book, it's City Club CEO Dan Maltrop. He'll now introduce our panelists. Dan, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Priyanka. Um, I had I'd written a little joke in the intro there for Priyanka, who's you know to say that like Dan Maltrop, who will moderate okay despite the fact, despite his gender. Um, <laughs> she said she didn't want to do the joke, so there you go. <laughs> So anyway, let me introduce our panelists. We have uh, co-author and, and Brown Flynn founder, Margie Flynn, next to me. Next to her is Sue Fuhrer, who's featured in the book. She's the director of the Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center. And, uh, and next to her, over at the far end of the stage, is Jerry Sue Thornton, a legend in Cleveland. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Um, uh, Jerry Sue, as, as you all know, was president of Tri-C uh, for, um, for over two decades. And um, we're so pleased to have the three of you here. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and um, so Barbara Brown, Margie Flynn, congratulations on your, on your 20 years in, uh, in, in, wor in, in, in service to, uh, to the economy, to corporations, to clients, to the community. To the uh, to the many bottom lines that you keep your uh, keep focused on, um, and thank you for the book, both of you. I mean, what a gift to the community to uh, to celebrate your 20th anniversary not by throwing yourselves a party, but by honoring the um, the people who are making our community a better place. So thank you. Thank you. Um, tell us about uh, about how you decided to honor your 20 to celebrate your 20th anniversary with the book. So I would say that one of the things that Brown Flynn values greatly uh, is that every five years we do something to give back to the community in a bigger way. We have a strong culture of giving back. And so Barb and I um, have often been told, and for those who don't know, Barb Brown, would you stand up for one moment, please? <laughs> Uh, Brown Flynn and this book would not be what it is without Barb. So, and um, it would just be Flynn, I guess. It would just know. be Flynn. <laughs> Flynn, Flynn. Uh, oftentimes, Barb and I have been told over the years that, oh, you should write a book. You should write a book. You should write a book. And in this case, we thought 
here we have this opportunity at our 20th anniversary to do something to give back. And instead of trying to tell our own story, uh, we felt it was more uh, powerful and um, an opportunity to reach out and interview and tell the stories of other outstanding, influential, powerful women. And so we set out on the journey. Uh, we were fortunate to have Beth Mooney, the chair of Key Corp, as our champion. She's featured in the book. And she was so much a part of helping us get this idea off the ground. And it was three years in the making um, from the beginning to the publication of the book. We are so thrilled and so delighted uh, to have so many excellent women that are, are part of this effort. But the piece of this is uh, what better way to uplift other women in particular than through the YWCA. And so being our partner in this effort, so all net proceeds, as Dan mentioned, going to them. Uh, but I do have to pause for one moment and say the book isn't just for women. And that is critically important. So I would like to ask every single man and male in this room to please stand, including our Mark Miller from Brown Flynn. <laughs> and we need to acknowledge him for being here. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, it, is a, it is a challenge, though, with these. When, you know, when we did an event about a year ago um, about, uh, about specifically about gender diversity and, and, and pay equity in the workplace, and it was really hard to get the dudes to show up. <laughs> um, but, um, so, but uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're embarrassed and they're all like tuning in on the, on the live stream, dudes. <laughs> um, so, what, let me, I just wanna stick with you for a second here, Margie. What was the most surprising thing for you in this, in this book? What is the thing you learned, the, or one of the most surprising things you learned as you interviewed these women who lead? Well, there's, there were a lot of surprises and, in some cases, validation of mm -hmm. things that we expected to learn. Um, I think one thing that, uh, as much as it's a book about woman, women, how many of these women cite men as a, the, the strength behind what they are today and how important that is. And so that, we feel, is really important. Um, and I also think that, you know, based on the title, how many of these women, including those up on this stage, uh, that they got to where they are today from really hard work and what they've done to lead organizations and companies uh, to heights that perhaps men could not have accomplished. And yet they want to be recognized just as leaders mm -hmm. uh, versus being recognized that they're women leaders. And so I think that that's, again, important for people to recognize. And I think it is, we hope, just a point in time mm -hmm. um, that a book like this won't be needed or is not something that others will be interested in 10 years from now. Maybe, I don't know about five years from now. I don't know, there's, a, now. there's always, there's, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good leadership book, right? So it's, right. A, it's about leadership more than it's about women in leadership, but we're gonna talk about both things right. today. Um, the other piece that's implicit in the title is that these are leaders, the three of you, and the others you focus on in the book who are lifting others up. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I know that, that for a lot of people, like the, the, the question I wanna ask both of you, Jerry Sue and, and, and Sue Fuhrer, is about you know, kind of what is your personal mission as a leader? I think a lot of leaders think about their work and have to, and, and rely on a sort of a mission statement, whether that's an internally kind of aware thing or an explicit thing that you say to yourself a lot. Um, but Sue, why don't we start with you? So um, obviously I'm the CEO of the VA Medical Center and so proud of the mission. The reality is none of us would be here. We, none of us would have a home if it weren't for the brave, the veterans of this country. So I've worked for the VA for 32 years, started at the very bottom as a management intern. And my leadership mission, I believe, is I'm an administrator. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. So I don't touch patients. So I'm very much dependent on the team. And as a leader, I think you have to, the first thing you have to have is integrity. You know, if the people you lead don't feel that you have integrity, you're, you're not being transparent and honest. And of course, I come from the public service se sector, so we are certainly transparent. Um, no one's gonna follow you. You have to be committed. You have to be an advocate, not necessarily of yourself, but of your team. And uh, you have to always show respect and you have to be dedicated to excellence. You can never be willing to take the easy way out. You have to do the harder right. 
And so in healthcare, if you take those acronym, those letters from each letter, it's I care. And so in healthcare, we care. And um, those are the principles that I try to lead by and live by. Mm -hmm. Jerry Sue, what's your? I know you, you're, you're sort of known as the dream catcher. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> the company that I have now that is called Dreamcatcher Educational Consulting, and I mm -hmm. selected that because it really is about catching people's dreams. And hopefully my leadership, which has predominantly been in education, but also serving on corporate boards and being involved with business and industry as well, has been about access and opportunity for people. I'm in the people business. I've always been in the people business, and education is about that which is why I'm glad we have these students who've chosen to be with us here in Cleveland today, mm -hmm. as well as the Mandel Scholars, the students from Cuyahoga Community College that I'm so proud of. But it's about helping people find their pathways to their greatness and what they want to contribute to our country, to our state, to our city locally. And so if we can be um, an, a pathway for that, if we can be a, an opportunity, an instrument in helping people move forward, that's really what leadership is about. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a servant leadership Absolutely. kind of model. Um, Margie, did you find as you were doing this work and the, the, the interviews and the writing that your own definition of leadership and your own understanding of your own leadership was changing? I don't, I don't know that it changed as much as uh, what we heard were so many um, characteristics and values that mm -hmm. aligned with the values that we espouse at Brown Flynn. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, it, you talk about servant leadership, um, so much about empowerment, so much about, you know, encouragement, acknowledgement, all those things that help to bring a team along or help to uh, uplift others in, mm -hmm. and carry as they climb is the, is the phrase you often hear. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, that led to a change in leadership as much as a reinforcement and just a reminder of all the things that these amazing women have done are things that Barb and I espouse to do every single day when we're leading our company and mm -hmm. so I, I think as those of you who have read the book or haven't read the book yet you will find uh, so many different stories of women coming from so many different places the hardships they overcame the challenges they overcame to get to the top and, um, and yet they still stand strong. Mm -hmm. Jay Sue Thornton, your route to, uh, to leadership began in the classroom as a, an English professor, and then you became a dean, and then ultimately president of Tri-C. When you're a professor, you're kind of a, you're a leader, but it's a weird sort of leadership because like, because the students sort of have, you, you sort of just tell them what to do, and they, and, and or you, follow, or you, or you know you're like these are, here's the curriculum here's the syllabus this is what we're going to do and there's not there's not any pushback is sort of at the student's own peril um, but when you're a dean it's a very it, that that's a that's a whole other thing right where you are then i mean the the standard thing you hear is that you know you're hurting cats because you've got a bunch of people who uh, who like to write their own curriculum and write their own syllabus and they don't want to be told what to do at all so can you talk a little bit about transitioning into leadership and what you learned about yourself as you were doing that? Well, you know, Dan, I, I'm a firm believer, and I've even written articles about this, that leadership happens throughout an organization, mm -hmm. that leadership is through the middle, it's through every part of an institution. So it doesn't just reside with the president. So you don't really make a transition from a particular role to another role and then become a leader. When I was a teacher in the classroom, I felt very much like a leader. Um, I may have had 30 students in, in a class or 25 students in a class, but it was an opportunity to really pull from them all the knowledge that they have that they don't even necessarily realize they have. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful opportunity to guide, to lead the learning that happens in a classroom. And so when you just move to a different level at the college or university, you're just moving to a different level of leadership. So you do things differently. You're mm -hmm. doing a different job. But leadership is throughout an organization. And I think that's where teamwork and high-powered teams really come into play. When people believe wherever they sit in an organization that they're a leader, mm -hmm. then they're going to give their absolute best talents and experience and skills to that job. Mm -hmm. So you just sit in a different seat. Yeah. And accountability can be different. Yeah. 
Sh Sue Fira, go. Add on to that, um, you know, hospitals are very diverse teams at all levels because everybody brings something different. You have nurses, you have physicians, ancillary, and business people. And so when I started as an unpaid intern, um, you know, I, was, I always viewed myself as a valued member because I brought something that the doctors and the nurses didn't know, and that was business know-how. And I think it's really important when you think about leadership, just as Jerry Sue said, it doesn't matter if you're a frontline team, you know, delivering trays, food trays, or you're in the C-suite making executive decisions. Everyone needs to be a leader in their particular role. And that's where diversity comes in and feeling comfortable in your own skin. And it's not necessarily about being a woman. It mm -hmm. may be, you know, I was intimidated by doctors when I was an unpaid intern. I don't know anything about medical care. But as you grow in your team, you have to be comfortable in your own skin and be ready, as Jerry Sue said, bring your A-game. Bring that knowledge that you have. When you move up the ladder into higher levels of leadership, I think your role is to really foster the confidence of all the team members and make everyone feel that there is a culture that it's okay to speak out, it's okay to think differently. And when you have teams and everybody thinks differently and brings something in, that's when the team rocks. I mean, that's mm -hmm. when really innovative things happen and that's when you have a great culture in an organization. But Sufir, so when you were an intern, did you feel that way? So, you know, I spent <laughs> some time thinking about that. Yeah. And um, I, I think that I f had great mentors, many of whom were men, many who were very preeminent physicians, you know, very strong, you know, academic professors of, of college. And I think that they fostered that. So, mm -hmm. you know, did it take me a while? Yes. I think I have some value because in my organization, I started at the very bottom. I worked my way up. I worked side by side with most of my staff. And I guess... How I felt 30 years ago is hard for me to remember. I'm mm -hmm. old. <laughs> but, um, you know, my, my mission right now is to make sure that those young people really, really, and I know Summer of the Cuyahoga is here, and thank you all for coming to Cleveland. I came here 30 years ago from Boston, and I thought this was a bad town. It's a great town, so <laughs> come back. But um, 30 years forward, my job is to make sure those young people have the confidence, because frankly, they have a skill set that, I don't have, and I depend on them to bring that skill set to our teams. And part of what it sounds like you're saying too is that, like, you didn't know it, but you were a leader all along. Mm -hmm. And and I know, Margie, when you are a founder of something in particular, it's a big risk. And when you're doing it, you're sort of manufacturing your own confidence. You're making it up, somewhat. <laughs> At least, I, I mean, I don't know. I I, I could be projecting. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 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 but um, but I, I know that, that sometimes what's required of leaders is to make people believe that you believe, well, right? I, that is true. What are they believing in, though? Yeah. And so the key is what is the vision and where as a whole do you want, whether it's a team of two, a team of 10, a team of 20, where, where are we all heading together? And, mm -hmm. and each person can, can feel that they're part of something bigger um, but it's up to Barb and me that we are clearly, that we believe in the mission, that we believe we can conquer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're certainly not a massively large organization with 5,600 employees like Sue has, um, but uh, we're a small but mighty team. And mm -hmm. it's important for us, and, and we punch above our weight. And so for all of our team, for them to feel that sense of, yes, we can, we can succeed, we're going to overcome challenges, yes, it does require us in difficult times to say, all right, we're going to rise above it and we need to show the team that we together can overcome a challenge or we can make it to that next level of performance together. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean... I don't know exactly what, what was going on when, when you and Barb founded the business, but I assume it was just the two of you. And it, it's very different than when you have when you start bringing on employees because there's, when Nancy Kramer spoke here last year, she was talking about how every new employee she brought on, she, um, she started, she imagined a little bird in a nest, you know, waiting for the food to be brought back. And like, you have to bring the work right. back, right? right? You got it. And, and then, you know, five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, you're, a corporate leader. Right. Well, and I think, you know, Barb and I have often said it's, it's almost like we gave birth to our, per, our 
fourth child because we each mm -hmm. had three. And it's um, Brown Flynn's now 21 years old, so the child is legal. And and, <laughs> <laughs> and we do have beer o'clock on Fridays. So. Yeah. Um, but to your point, yes, the, at one point in time, it was Brown and Flynn. And, mm -hmm. and we came to the realization, which was very inspiring, that it is now something more and bigger, but it's up to us to nurture that mm -hmm. entity and ensure that the values we've espoused and what we believe in, um, that, that there isn't room uh, to sacrifice those. And those people that we bring on to our team um, need to espouse the Brown Flynn values. One of the best decisions we made, the more Barb and I, it, the company grew, we're able to work on the business and not in the business thanks to some outstanding senior leadership we, we've brought on. And frankly, one of the best decisions was we don't do all of the hiring. We, we are involved at certain levels in that, but it is difficult because you're always saying, oh, well, you know, is that person, are we too close to it? Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've also... Yeah, leadership is often about letting go. Exactly. That's interesting. I want to um, jump into a, a thorny area. Uh, which has been covered in the news a lot lately, um, the sexual harassment allegations at Uber and other startups, and, um, and the fact that corporate culture in America is not always hospitable to, uh, to women in leadership roles or to women's own professional development. And um, you all have worked in a variety of different environments, and from your own organizations to then the larger organizations that your organizations interact with. And Jerry Sue, you mentioned your service on corporate boards, which are their own kind of um, mysterious animal that you could describe for us if you want, if you're allowed. Um, but, um, but I just would want to invite you to, to sort of reflect on your own experiences and what we're reading in the news lately about these high growth companies that haven't paid enough attention to some of these very important issues. And I think Barb and, and Margie really did a great job of writing about the challenges uh, that women leaders do face in the environment, um, and I, as well as the successes. And I think you need to balance it and see that that's true for both. Um, but I think there are challenges for young people as well. I think there are challenges for men as well. I, as um, you're developing your leadership, I think you have to decide for yourself who you want to be and what you want to achieve. And you can't let other people define who you are and where you're going and what you're going to ultimately have as your legacy. So I do think there are challenges, but you know, in the book, I, I mentioned that as, as I was growing in my leadership, I was aware that there were issues, I, were, I was aware there were sexism, there were challenges of all kinds. But, and I, I fancy myself and used to be a good golfer. I don't have to, time to golf anymore, so I'm not such a good golfer. But when I golfed, you really learn early on not to look at the sand and the water because they're there. It's a given. The sand and the water are in the golf courses. And if you look at them and you think about them, you'll hit them every time. <laughs> if you think about the challenges, you, you will become so obsessed with those that you won't achieve your goals and your mission and what you want to, to achieve. So yes, they're there. If they require legal action, you take legal action. If they require uh, co courageous conversations with people, you have those confrontation, and confrontation's not bad, courageous confrontation with people. But at the end of the day, you still have to get your job done. You have to achieve your mission. So it means having courage to do what you need to do, being calculating about what you're de doing, not foolish, thinking it through, having a strategy, having a plan, but keeping in mind where you want to go so that no one takes you off of mission. Can you share a story about a courageous confrontation? I've had many courageous confrontations. <laughs> <laughs> I think one where I had a supervisor that um, I was aspiring to a promotional opportunity and who said to me, well, you know, that's not a woman's job. You're not going to get that. Um, so, you know, you kind of be happy where you are. And I said, well, thank you very much for that advice. I doubt that I'll take it. I'm not that kind of person anyway. So I'm going to keep going forward with your help or without your help. Because if I can't do it in this organization, there are other places. And so I don't feel cemented in this organization. And if there's no opportunity here, I will certainly look for greener pastures where 
my talents, my skills, my contributions can make a difference. So you have to be willing. Did you say willing. that calmly and eloquently yeah, at the time? Yeah, I did. I'm always. <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact. I bet. <laughs> and and at the same time, I was planning, planning the exit because you just don't go. In the lawsuit or no? You plan no, no, no not okay. at all. You okay. plan the exit. Uh huh. And you you again keep your eye on the target for where you want to go and what you mm -hmm. want to achieve. Because those kinds of conversations can set you back if you let them. If mm -hmm. you believe and if you give power over to other people, they will seize it uh, and direct your pathway. But if you hold on to it, they won't. Margie, you, you said uh, you had a, so, a story. Uh, this goes back to when I was younger in my career, when I was in financial services. Um, and I traveled a lot with the executives for the analyst roadshows in investor relations at the time. And um, never forget being in the elevator of the World Trade Center. We're heading up to an important meeting with analysts. Um, there was just tremendous um, ego in that elevator and that they really wanted to get a buy on the stock. And they just, and my job was to prepare them. I had, that was my goal, the presentation, everything was my, my responsibility. And so we were in the elevator and the one executive turns to me and said, I think we're all set, Margie, we're all set. Now all we need you to do is show them a little leg and we'll be all set. No. And I was young and I was quite frankly naive. I was a little bit shell-shocked and yet I didn't say anything. I just, because I didn't know what to say. And in today's world, I do question, you know, what, what would be the implications of that and how I would only hope that if anyone did experience something like that and or if the reverse happened, that if male or female, that they would have the courage, which I didn't have at the time, to confront or to say anything. And so... What would you uh, tell your younger self to say? I would have waited until after the meeting, let the meeting be done, and would have handled it, asked for a, a separate meeting with mm -hmm. this particular executive. Mm -hmm. And to explain that, um, number one, I, I, that this was completely unprofessional, and that I'm there to do a job, and that, that, sh that it should never happen again. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, I would potentially put my job at risk maybe, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I didn't at the time have the courage to do that. Now I can tell you, um, there was an event that Accenture hosted around Women's Leadership Day and the book was featured. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the women there came up to me afterward and she said to me, um, I just had that happen about two months ago. Oh. So unfortunately, things like this still happen in the workplace. And as you well, said, as, as we said, obviously. I mean, the, and the Times has covered and so it. So yeah. I just think it's a matter of you know having courage, handling it professionally, eloquently, as Jerry Sue has. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have that courage back then. Sue Fuhrer. So um, what I have to say about this, and maybe maybe a little bit different. I was very naive and. Um, when I started my career, I was 30 years younger. I was a lot younger and a lot thinner and worked in a very male-oriented organization with the exception of nurses, strictly since all of our patients, for the most part, were male. And they were veterans and they were older. So you would walk down the hall and you would get looks and you would, you know, and, and Barb has Neighbor. some family members <laughs> that works at the VA. And so, um, you know, you have to kind of I don't want to say pick your battles, but recognize you know what is purposeful and mean spirited, and what is frankly they just might not know better, or or might be generational, and um, so as I've gone through my career, there were bosses that wanted to kiss me on the cheek every morning. You know, there was somebody that liked me to turn the air conditioner on um, to see the view. I personally, it was better, way better back then. <laughs> Nobody asked me to do that now. <laughs> um, but, but you know, my, my, I was one of you know three girls in my family. My dad taught me I could be every, anything that I wanted to be, and I could do just about anything a man could do. So I didn't let that stuff kind of get in my way. I guess mm -hmm. it was like I wasn't going to bite. I wasn't going to make an issue of it. Um, you know, if you're in a male's env male environment, they're going to talk about sports. They're going to talk about things that maybe aren't important to me. I've really um, mentored a lot of young women. Uh, certainly generations have changed. Young women walk down the hall and the veteran will whistle or say, oh, you look really nice, and they get really offended. And I sit down and I say, well, you know, did, was, did he really mean to be mean? And 
frankly, sometimes I think, wait 30 years and you might want that compliment again. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm not trying to make belittle that by any means, but I think for the most part, sometimes, at least from the veteran perspective, it, it's harmless. And um, as Jerry said, stick to your mission, know what, you, what your focus is, and, and don't get too derailed. Can I, can I push back on the harmlessness thing for a second? Because I know that there's probably people listening right now who are thinking, well, the military has a sexual assault problem. And like, you know, the Secretary of the Navy addressed it when he right. spoke here. Correct. So maybe it's not harmless? And in some cases it's not, it's not harmless. Um, certainly, um, how do I want to phrase this? Um, yeah, there are real sexual harassment. We have a huge sexual uh, military sexual trauma program at the hospital for both women and men. There is sexual harassment for men as well as women. Um, so clearly that it happens. I am not a military expert. There is a hierarchy. I think the, the Department of Defense had, had for decades not realized there, were a problem. there was a problem when in fact there was a problem. I think you need to identify things that Margie talked about from a superior, different from walking down the hall and there's a World War II veteran um, waiting for an appointment that says, gee, you look really nice today. Yeah. Um, and I guess I personally have not experienced sexual harassment in the workplace to the point where I ever thought it was important enough to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thanks for clarifying. It's yeah. just, yeah, Jerry yeah, Sue. I am glad that we have women on juries I am glad that we have women female lawyers because mm -hmm. sometimes you really do have to take legal action when it's something that you think is beyond just a, a casual kind of comment. But again, as Sue said, you pick your battles and you pick the battles where you know you have enough evidence to go to court. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in court before and you have to not be afraid to do that. You, you may lose, you may win, but you have to move forward. If it's severe enough and you think that somebody has broken the law in mm -hmm. some way, that you need to take advantage of moving into the legal system. Sue made me think a minute ago of a very funny story, and that was uh, as a young professor, among other men and women professors, and I was young, so one of the male professors said to me, honey, would you make the coffee? And I didn't drink coffee, so I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I made the worst coffee in the world. <laughs> and I was never asked to make coffee again. One way to handle it. <laughs> That's a great story to, to complete this part of our, as we move into the Q&A. Um, and a mental note, don't ask Jerry Sue for coffee. Never. Um, <laughs> ever. <laughs> so Jerry Sue Thornton is, uh, is a part of our panel. She's the former president of Tri-C, the Cuyahoga Community College. Also with us on the panel today, Sue Fuhrer. She's the CEO of the Lewis Stokes VA Medical Center. She's been in that role since 2011. Yes, okay. And Margie Flynn is with us as well. She is the co-author of the book we're discussing, Uplifting Leaders, who happen to be women, co-authored with Barbara Brown, her business partner, Brown Flynn. Um, we're going to go to the audience Q&A with all of you and any of you who want to join us by who are joining us via the web stream or um, or our Facebook live stream. If you want to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the program. Same goes for if you want to leave a comment in the Facebook live stream as well in the comments section there. We can work it into the program. Um, holding our microphones today are Corey Isler and uh, Faye Walker from our team. So may we have our first question, please? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is such an important forum, and I'm so glad that all of you are here. Um, I spent 40 years in, in education, and um, I taught basically middle school and high school. So if this audience were to turn into an audience of middle school girls, how would you explain to them that their brain is much more important than their body? Any of you? <laughs> They're all nodding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the educator. Jerry Sue, I think you get to be first. You're closest the over there, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I was the just teacher. thinking about it, and I think one of the, the way, I, I'm a visual learner, so one of the things that I might do would be to show young women pictures of us over time, where our bodies change, where we look different, um, where age, like with men, things happen. Yeah, and so maybe you don't have that body you think you have uh, in the future, but you have that brain. And so I try to show um, in a pictorial way 
um, how insignificant the physical is and how truly important the mind is um, and, and how much more you can accomplish by learning, educating yourself so that you can be really productive. Um, and, and I think in helping them see examples of women who have used their brain and how far it's gotten them versus women who've used their bodies and it's not gotten them anywhere. Hi, I'm Maria from uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, question, so the topic of women leadership has been around for a little bit, but it still feels relatively new. And I feel like we're here talking about trying to prove how women are great and we're showing statistics about how women are even better sometimes than men, right? And I'm curious about your thoughts on how do we get from here to where we no longer talk about it, where it's just people, professionals, leaders, whatever it may be, and we just forget the women versus men thing. So I think that that's been my philosophy, and when I was making those comments earlier, I think that I went into the job environment 30 years ago with the understanding that I could do pretty much anything a man could do, and maybe a little better, but you know, there are people that are black, there are people that are white, there are women, there are men. Everyone comes to the table with, with some sort of diversity, and I don't think we should let ourselves succumb to those stereotypes, and I think that we need to work really hard. And so when Margie and Barb came to my office to interview me, they were asking some of those questions, and I said, you know, I really never thought about, you know, I'm a woman, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> well, maybe, but, um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna go out and do the very best I can, and I am going to prove that any job that's given to me I can do with excellence, and uh, that's what I, I stayed focused on, on, and I tried not to let some of the noise bother me, and I hope that as we move forward, we continue to do that, that it doesn't matter where you come from or how you, how you got there, you are there, and it is now your responsibility um, to be accountable and to perform. I would just add that, you know, you, you look at the statistics today, so of the Fortune 500 companies, 6.4% of them are women, and sadly, only two women of color that are leading these Fortune 500 companies. So to your point, how do you change? How do you shift that? And how do you move the needle? And I think that for everyone in this room who has the opportunity to mentor and guide and lead and uplift others within your workforce, um, that's our obligation. And I think we especially this amazing young generation that's coming out of school today, um, and, and they, they want to be um, recognized not just because maybe uh, they were a female or, okay, I got promoted because I was a minority. Mm -hmm. um, we are there to blaze a trail and make sure that those um, that are striving to move up the ladder, that we're there advocating for them. And, and there's many people who have that opportunity, and I just don't think they take the time. And so some of it is uh, a matter of not just helping to mentor coach, but then advocating. You know, there's a difference. There's mentorship, and then there's those that, who are your advocates? And mm -hmm. who can you work with in your organization to ensure that these people are recognized and that they're rising to the top? You know, a lot of you are talking about sort of ignoring the noise, not, not focusing on the, on the sand trap and things like that. But is there something more intentional some, some women talk about changing, intentionally changing their behavior to actually, you know, when meeting a group, reaching out to the women first rather than defer going directly to the white male um, in the group who, like, because there's often the assumption that if there's a group of people, the white male is the boss or something like that. <laughs> Are there things that you advocate for or do, Jerry Sue Thornton, uh, in that way? That's an interesting question. I was thinking... Um, that you can't ignore the sand and water being there, you just don't focus on it. And as I heard that question a minute ago, I kept thinking, women haven't arrived, um, ethnic groups haven't arrived, I think there's still a striving for an equal playing field, whatever that might look like, so that talents and experiences and skills would rise to the top. So I think there is a striving. I would say, and I'll speak for them, Barb and Margie, I think wrote their book uplifting leaders, but also to focus on the accomplishments of women so that others, male and female, 
could see how women have achieved and been able to achieve their goals. Um, so I think we, we have to still focus on those challenges that are there. I don't think we have to change who we are as people as we're doing it. But I think we have to be conscious that it isn't a, an even playing field yet and that women will have to work harder, have to work smarter as they aspire to goals that may not be traditional for women. Mm -hmm. I remember coming to Cleveland as a president and at the time there were about three or four of us who were college, university, women presidents and it hadn't happened in the past in those numbers and people said, where did you all come from? I mean, how did you get here? Well, all of us had come up through the ranks. We had paid our dues over time and, and gotten into those positions. But people weren't used to seeing us in those positions. And I think that's what we want for young women today. We want them to see the possibility. We want them to see the potential. That if I'm here, you can also get there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for, for the young millennials to, to see that and for the young men to see to see women moving in, that their moms, their sisters, their future daughters can hold those positions. Mm -hmm. Your next question. So my question is kind of like a three part. So the first thing is, was there a time in your journey that you used being a woman as an advantage? Um, was there, and not only that, but in a competitive world of being women, you know, a lot of times women are very critical of each other. How were you able to surpass even that part, not just the men, but the other women in the room, to be that driving force, to motivate and empower others to be that person as well. And uh, the last question is, what was your driving force to even let you rise above to know that it was bigger than you? Wow. wow. <laughs> do you want to yeah. just right. sit down right. here? <laughs> <with you>? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> next time. OK. <laughs> So, so let's take that first yeah, one. Right. Okay. 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 What is your position as a woman? Right. Using, okay. using what your, your femininity or your gender as an advantage. I have to say that I, I have not ever, um, but I have used my name as an advantage. Now, people thought I was a male walking in the door. The way I spell Jerry is J-E-R-R-Y. And if I choose not to use my middle name, I get in the door and then they say, who are you? <laughs> and I say, I'm the Jerry you're getting ready to interview. So it's been interesting, not necessarily have I used it intentionally, but it, it has happened that way. Um, but I have not used being a woman uh, as an advantage because I've never seen an opportunity in a job situation where somebody said, I'm looking for a woman for this job. I would say that you know, I don't recall where I've used it as you know, a leverage tool, but I can <laughs> say for our company, that we are a certified female business enterprise, an FBE. And so that, you know, we haven't seen tremendous traction from that in terms of, oh gosh, all these opportunities are swarming our way. But we have gotten projects because we are female business certified, and enterprise certified enterprise. And uh, so there are times where companies will come to us to be subcontractors for their projects. And so that has served to our advantage. What about this notion, the second part of her question was about being critical of women being mm -hmm. overly critical of one another. Well, I think that's a reality. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like your question. I think it's a reality. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked in situations where board members were female and they did not advocate for me having an appropriate salary that they would have given to a male president. Um, because I've been a president in Minnesota as well as in Ohio. So I have seen that and it's, it's sad. I think sometimes it happens because people believe they have to play out the roles, the gender roles, and they behave as men when they're doing that. In many ways, they're saying, I have got to, in whatever their definition is, be more male in my behavior than I am another woman with you supporting you, uplifting you, understanding your challenges and where you're coming from. And I think we have to take those individuals, males and females, who are our supporters and run with them. And I think those who are not supporting us, step away. Step away from them. So I have a, a 
couple comments. One, I don't know that I ever intentionally used being a woman for leverage, but I think early in my career, when I was young and blonde and sitting at a table, and there were many people at a much higher level than I, you know, you can really kind of sit back and look, and they don't really expect much from you, either because you're young or because you, you know, back then you were a girl. Um, and I think it gave me a little bit of an advantage because I actually got to be able to watch the room a little bit and figure out, you know, where I was going to make my points or how I was going to respond to certain questions. So I, not necessarily an overt, you know, take advantage of being a woman, but I think when you're young and you have that advantage of really using it to your advantage to really check out the room, check out the board table, um, and make decisions. And then the other thing that I was going to say, um, you know, I come from a little bit of a different environment. I've worked for the federal government, so there have been quotas. And I come up upon a time when, you know, it was like, how many white men are CEOs? How many white women are CEOs? How many black men are CEOs? And when I was going through the ranks, I never wanted to be hired because somebody wanted me to be the white woman quota. I wanted to be hired because I was the best qualified. And when I mentor, and coach other people, that's really what I, you know, try to not look exactly what you are, but, you know, make sure that we are hiring the most qualified people, because sometimes in the federal government we don't, we don't do that. We, we make exceptions, and uh, to have a high-performing organization, you have to hire the most qualified person. Mm -hmm. And one last Jerry point Sue. to your question. You know, I think sometimes women are not supporters of women because they think of it as a zero-sum game, that if you're there, I can't get there. Or if she's there, there's no opportunity for me. And that's just not the case. Men don't think that way. There's plenty of opportunity. I need to find my own pathway. I, have to, I need to find my own success. And oh, by the way, while I'm doing that, I need to pull my sisters up with me. Margie Flynn, go ahead. I was just going to say, too, that you know my father always had a phrase that he shared with us as children. And he said, show me your friends, and I'll show you what you're made of. And so the same could be true in many respects of show me your colleagues, show me the people that you're working with and the kind of people that you're affiliating with, and it'll really show you what you are made of. And at the point in time where women, yes, the women can be catty. Um, and, and men, I, I don't know that it's necessarily just women, but, but, but I've seen it. And so I can only say that you know, sometimes your best colleague and friend during that time is a man or a male, and that in many respects to Jerry Sue's point, that you know what you're made of, and it's just a matter of stepping away from those that aren't going to um, allow you to create, make you the best person you can be. The third part to her question had to do with when, when you realized like, that this was all bigger than you and what your driving force was. Because it, it isn't just about you and your career, right? Yeah, this is right. about changing the world. Right. Right. It's always exactly. been bigger than us. Right. When you right. think about it, and I think Sue spoke to mission, mm -hmm. and and um, it really, it's always been bigger than who we are. We only mm -hmm. occupy a space on this earth for a short period of time. When we think about it, how much can you get done during the time that that birth date's there and that other date's there, and the dash is all you're working yeah. with. <laughs> Well, that seems so insignificant. <laughs> it's just a dash. <laughs> Where's our next question? Please. As a new graduate in engineering, I'm learning a lot, and I'm wanting to bring in fresh ideas. Can you describe a time in which you brought in a new idea and failed, and how did you overcome that in your career? So I've brought lots of ideas that have failed. <laughs> it happens probably daily. Um, and I think, um, so my first um, experience with uh, Chief of Staff many years ago, I worked really hard on a paper um, about cholecystectomy, and it was a new uh, model of care at the time. And I thought that it was brilliant. And I went to his office, and he, like, read it. And you could tell by the look on his face. And the next minute, he threw it up in the air, and he said, it's fruit salad. And it was like, oh, I was crushed. Um, and there have been many instances when that's happened. But you know, you have to be true to your convictions and true to your beliefs. And if that tact didn't work, I mean, 
I went up to my office, I had a little pity party for myself for a few minutes, and then I said, you wanna know what? Okay, let's take that criticism and let's figure it out. And the next time I went down there with my paper, it rocked. So sometimes you have to change your tact a little bit or change your technique, but don't give up. If it's something you believe in, and this is what I tell all my employees, I mean, if it's important, stick to it. Um, but you're not gonna be perfect every time either. Yeah. And it may not be the time for that idea. So it may not be a bad idea, it just may not be the time that it's going to work, or it may not be this place where it's going to work. So I'm with Sue, save it, because you may have something very valuable that in the future can move forward and be a real gift from you to the company or to whomever it is that you're offering uh, that idea, that project, that, that uh, gift. So think about it in context. May not be right for this time, may not be right for this company, may not be right for this group, but I'm not going to shelve the idea and give up on it. As Sue said, was there criticism that can help me improve on the idea, to change it, to grow it in a different way? But if you believe in it and you think it has merit, don't give it up. I think, too, the other thing that um, one instance in particular, and Barb can relate to this, is um, the woman that we dedicated the book to, Mary Griffith, she was our former boss when Barb and I job shared in corporate America for six and a half years. And she was tough. She was tough. In fact, she showed us you know, what it, what it takes to be a great leader, and there's many things that we learned from her of things we didn't want to, to carry on in our leadership. But you know, we deliver things to her thinking we were on the right path, only to receive back, I hate it. That's what she would write on the paper. Oh. Oh. And so I would pick up the phone and call Barb, and I'd say, oh, I don't think it went over so well. <laughs> I don't think she liked it, but I have no idea why she didn't like it. But it forced us to, to in some cases, should we have tested or shown whatever we created to someone else in the organization before going to Mary with this, I don't know the answer at that time. Maybe, Barb, you might remember. I don't know. But um, I think that's key is are there others within your organization that you might be able to vet some of these ideas and get a little bit more validation before you go forward? And second, depending on what company you're working with, do they encourage uh, idea sharing? And do they promote, you know, we you know, starting with a no idea is a bad idea framework, um, that's not to say that we can act on every idea. But, but more important to if you are going to come up and try something new, we encourage our team to try things that are new. But if it's gonna fail, ideally fail fast. Mm -hmm. um, you wanna know sooner rather than later, and then you move on. And so as an entrepreneurial <coughs> firm, that's core, you know, that we have to have that continual idea generation. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, you know, I don't know how you got to know, um, or you know, this isn't a good idea. Um, but as you all go through your leadership journey, um, I have learned more lessons on how not to lead. Examples of like, I don't want to ever do this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the specific circumstances, but maybe you know, there's a lesson too for you to learn that you know, I don't want to ever turn somebody down that way or say no that way, and I will figure out how to do it differently when I'm in that position. And a last sentence might be, no just means no, not right now, but not no forever. Where's our next question? Here we go. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a student at um, University of Pennsylvania, but I grew up and I went to high school here in the Cleveland area, and I did debate all through high school. Um, and when I'm listening to this discussion of courage and being able to deal with um, uncomfortable situations or having confrontations with courage, but I think that the, the type of courage that we're describing is often, like you said, eloquent courage, or I would say proper courage, you know, calm courage. It reminds me of when I was in debate in high school how the women debaters, the female debaters, we had to toe the line between, between being abrasive and meek, whereas men were they had, I think, a broader spectrum of ways in which they could debate, broader spectrums of speaking styles. Um, you know, they could yell at you for the entire three minutes of cross sex and get no comments on a ballot card, but women would be called witchy or, you know, not a nice girl, as I often got told. Um, Good for you. Uh, <laughs> and I was wondering if you guys could comment on 
you know, I struggled with, yeah, that made me a much better debater. At the end of the day, I learned how to toe that line in a way that I think made me more eloquent and made me more refined in the way that I spoke. But at the same time, um, you know, I think when we look at women, or at least I read books about women CEOs and women who rise to the top of their field, those are the women that were able to toe the line. Whereas I think perhaps men have a broader spectrum up there, right? Maybe they weren't, they didn't have to watch what they say as much as um, women did. They could make such, um, you know, controversial statements to their female staff members. And is that the kind of success that we really want to perpetuate maybe now or, or even in the future, right? Do, do we want the women to be at the top just those who can toe the line? Or do we want them to have the same sort of broad spectrum that men enjoy or not? That's, you know, wondering what your what thoughts on that. Great question. Yeah, it is question. a good question. You know, I think, I, for me, it's about winning. For me, it's the bottom line. And so it's about the goal. Um, I love sports <coughs> of all kinds. And I'll just use a male sport for the most part, and that's football. Uh, how do you get the ball down the field? You may not be always the court. Well, it shouldn't be that the quarterback's running the ball, right? So. Ultimately, if you're looking at the game of life, the game of work, the game of careers, whatever it is, I'm about winning. And so how do we win and still stay true to who we are? I cannot outdo a man. I really can't. I can't yell louder than most men. That is not who I am. And so my winning is using my skills, my brain, my ability, my intellect to win. And I coach debate. I coach high school uh, a boys team actually of debaters in those days and the interesting thing was I had to kind of think like them as I was coaching them but if I'd been coaching a group of women I probably would have coached them a little differently because I would have wanted them to win so for me it's all about the goal with the end game and it's using your best intellect your best skills to win so you play the game as it is not try to change the rules right now I can't outman a man mm -hmm. Just the bottom line. Yeah. Ladies? So, um, I always learn a lot from Jerry Sue. You know? She's so, Don't we all? she's just brilliant. Um, so, so to come after her is kind of unfair. But, you know, I think that, <laughs> and life's unfair. Um, you know, I think sometimes women um, are a little bit more emotional or perceived to be more emotional when, when we are debating or when we get passionate. And so, I think that to the extent that you can, you know, make sure you stay to task and as, as Jerry Sue said, you know, understand the goal. Um, but, you know, I say it like it is. And if somebody wants to call me a witch or whatever, you know, that's okay. Um, but I do sometimes try to make sure that I don't get, my passion doesn't get caught up in emotion. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, that is not, that's counterproductive to the goal. And sometimes I just have to check that in. And I, you know, I don't know if that's a woman or a man thing or a person thing. That's a, that's a Sue Fuhr thing that um, I try to keep in check. Well, Sue Fuhr, Jerry Sue Thornton, Margie Flynn, Barb Brown, thank you for the conversation, for the book, for, um, for inspiring so many of us and for your, your candor in this conversation today. It's just been absolutely wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Club, we've been enjoying a panel discussion on lessons in leadership. Today's forum is presented by EY. It's also part of the City Club's Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We appreciate your support. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Brown Film, uh, Cuyahoga Community College, the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Humanities Center, Start Mart, and the Summer on the Cuyahoga Internship Program. We also welcome students from Flow Homeschool Co-op. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William E. Wise Foundation. We thank all of you for being here today. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.